forms, but we also have to talk about a fluidity of family forms, that most people will move through many different kinds of family forms uh, in their life. And marriage is certainly no longer the place where people spend most of their adult life or make most of their important life decisions, including whether to have children, even if they eventually marry uh, after they have children. Um, and recent changes in the evolution of marriage, and I'll come back to this, have had paradoxical results. They've actually increased the benefits of a well-functioning nuclear family for all of its members and um, increased the advantages that those uh, families have. But they've also increased the points at which a nuclear family that we used to think was adequately functioning can, be, can malfunction. Uh, or simply fail to, to cohere. And that is a, a, a tremendous, I think that's one of the big challenges we have uh, as sociologists, historians, therapists, uh, as, we, as we deal with this. And, that, and in fact, one of the themes that I'm going to get into. But all of these changes are playing out in the context of two powerful long-term shifts that for the last 40 years have been steadily rearranging the topography of family life in the West. The first is the extraordinarily powerful extension of civil rights and social recognition to new categories of people. I mean, there's a dramatic increase in the percentage of people who believe it's just wrong to deny economic opportunities, political and legal rights, and social respect to others on the basis of their gender, race, ethnicity, or sexual orientation. Progress here is incomplete, of course. Sometimes it triggers um, furious, even violent resistance, but it is real. Overt sexism, racism, and homophobia are more frowned upon uh, than in the past. Uh, children and teenagers have gained rights and a concern for their well-being that was previously denied to them. Um, <clears throat> and these kinds of things are revolutionizing family life all over the globe. Women's economic gains and social empowerments have had especially profound effects on family life. Uh, and support for same-sex marriage uh, is going to have those kind of effects, I think, as we begin to get uh, different models of how marriage can, uh, can be conducted. But this expansion of civil rights, of interpersonal equality, and social acceptance has been matched by an equally strong and dramatic growth in socioeconomic inequality and insecurity. Now, that growth has been especially dramatic in the United States, um, but nearly everywhere. There has been a long-term decline in the real wages and benefits of less educated workers, uh, an increase in economic instability and insecurity, even for middle-income workers, uh, they may have higher incomes for a while, but there's much more volatility. Um, and an upward distribution of income, wealth, and special privileges toward the uh, wealthiest 5%, and especially the wealthiest 1% of populations. Globalization, technological change, trade liberalization, uh, outsourcing, and the steady reduction in the power of organized labor have all worked together uh, to uh, to allow an increase in the skills, uh, in, in earnings premium for a minority of highly educated or technically trained workers, but less educated workers, and especially male workers, have really lost ground in real wages and employment prospects. Jobs have become less secure. Income volatility has increased, even for uh, what we would normally consider upper income uh, workers. According to a new report from the United Nations, the richest in the world's population, the richest 1% of the world's household, owns 40% of all available assets in the world, while the entire bottom half has to get by on 1% or less. So meanwhile, in the West, you get the spread of these neoliberal ideas that both reflects and accelerates what has been a very significant transfer of political and economic power from the people who produce goods and services uh, <clears throat> away, uh, away from the people who produce uh, goods and services to the absentee, often absentee owners of the places where they produce them, um, the middlemen who distribute and sell what they make, and the financial sector that has gained much more liberty than in the past uh, to reap profits from buying, selling, merging, dismantling 
uh, their companies, forcing concessions, uh, stripping companies and countries of their assets instead of providing the credit and investment needed to repair and rebuild uh, or construct new ones. Neither of these shifts toward greater equality in personal rights and societal ideals and greater inequality in economic opportunities and outcomes shows any sign of abating. And both of them have wrought huge transformations. On an individual level, more people have more options than ever before to freely exercise whatever economic and educational advantages they possess uh, or can procure. In more and more places, they can go to any school they can get into, live wherever they can afford a house, to buy a house, uh, marry, We're, we've now got an estimate that in October that will extend to uh, Australia, marry whoever <coughs> they love, or pursue a successful single life without the stigma that used to attach to it. Individuals who started off further behind have remained further behind, um, but, 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 but more and more people um, uh, excuse me, uh, have prospects, economic prospects, have become less secure. It's almost going back to the old Anatole France, uh, say, the, the, the law and its majestic equality forbids the rich as the poor from sleeping under the bridge. Now we allow the rich as well as the poor to maybe get married, <laughs> but uh, we have the same kind of economic uh, inequalities. Individuals who started off behind have fallen further behind, uh, but the risk of being laid off or losing assets has increased um, almost all across the board. And the new on-demand economy of Uber, which uh, I'm just being introduced to by Luke, but I uh, am hesitant to use, uh, and other <laughs> independent contractors, uh, provides flexibility at the price of predictability and long-term security. And we haven't uh, figured out in most countries how to deal with that uh, other either. So what I want to do is talk about how these kinds of interactions between, and I specifically want to concentrate on women's, uh, the growing equality between men and women on the one hand, and the growing inequality between social classes on the other, have, had, um, effect, uh, have affected family life in contradictory ways. Uh, women's new options and legal rights have improved their position within the family uh, as daughters and partners, and given them more options outside the family as individual actions. At the same time, the growing distance between different educational and social economic groups has created a widening class divide in access to secure family lives. And that has left far more women than men struggling to support children on their own. So the gains that women have made, we, I, I, I think that sometimes people who are not as old as I and haven't, haven't even lived through the 1960s, uh, sometimes underestimate the gains that women have made and how far we have come. Uh, we've seen a stunning increase in the educational attainment of, of women and the labor force participation of women, despite some recent stalls in countries where work family benefits and childcare innovations have not kept up uh, with demand. Uh, in places uh, like Hungary, uh, Poland, Spain, Singapore, and Japan, as well as in most wealthy uh, Western countries, women now earn the majority of university degrees. And in more and more countries, including some somewhat surprising places like Brazil, marriages where the woman has more education than the man now outnumber the opposite types of marriage. Uh, the gender segregation of working class jobs has been fairly resistant to change, but uh, women's real wages have been rising, starting from a much lower base in those jobs, uh, and men's have been falling, and we've seen very dramatic gains for women uh, in the higher prestige uh, occupations. Uh, the gender pay gap has been steadily shrinking. Uh, and I, and <clears throat> in line with your idea that, that you should always say unpopular things, I think that we very often uh, overestimate the gender pay gap. For example, in the United States, um, President Obama is always talking about how women earn 77 cents for every dollar that a man makes. That's a tremendous, uh, uh, a tremendous exaggeration because it doesn't take into account um, the work experience, the hours, uh, the, uh, the different major, occupational majors, uh, the times, the, uh, the work interruptions that women make. When you actually look at the progress that's been made, 
When we look at all workers aged 25 to 34 in America, women's hourly wages are now 93% of men's. And an unmarried woman, according to the UN, earns 96 cents to every dollar earned by an unmarried man in America. I was not able to find comparable figures for Australia, but I'm sure that you will see a similar. The gender pay gap has been decreasing. The amount of it that can be uh, attributed to, to non-objective factors, to blatant discrimination, has been lessening. The parent pay gap has been increasing. And of course, it tends to be women who um, take that. Um, uh, I do want to say in passing, uh, though, that we also need to recognize that despite the problems with violence that we see, there has been a stunning decline in domestic violence and intimate partner violence in most countries. Uh, in the US, the National Crime Victimization Survey captures more offenses than, uh, than police because it's anonymous reports. There's still some evidence that it may under-report, but it certainly doesn't under-report any less than it used to. And just between 1993 and um, 2010 alone, the rates of sexual assault and, and, and domestic violence uh, fell by more than 60%. We're seeing the same thing in cohabiting relations. Um, tremendous declines in that. So the gender revolution has had huge, has had huge benefits for women, but it has also <coughs> created new options and new challenges that require putting a lot more energy into private resources in family life. And that's what I'm going to be talking about the rest of the day. This tremendous, the gains that women have made uh, have really resulted in tremendous opportunities for improving parenting, for improving personal relationships, whether married or not. But precisely because we have made these tremendous gains toward equality, we now have to negotiate things rather than just uh, apply rigid gender roles where women defer to men. It requires more resources, cultural resources, uh, psychological resources, educational resources, social support systems, and more economic stability than it used to be uh, in the past to create a st stable uh, relationships. So it's particularly ironic. I think this happens here too, having had got get calls from Australia and New Zealand and all over the country every time CCF puts out a new briefing paper uh, about the, the press is going on and on about how the uh, women's economic gains are a threat to the family lives of educated women, that they're pricing themselves out of the marriage market. You get, you still hear that here, right? You know, because this is where I get the most, all of these calls. Uh, we're told that successful women are so threatening to men that, that uh, they can't find a husband, or that if they do find a husband, they'll have to compensate for it by, getting, by doing uh, more housework. That was a very, uh, famous sociological finding that turns out to be entirely wrong and accounted for by a small tail at the very end of it. Uh, last year in the, New York, at the US, um, the crazy the press went over a report that showed that when women found a husband who did share childcare and housework equally, such couples had less satisfactory sex lives than those uh, who followed a more traditional division of labor. Um, some of these claims were once true but they have all been turned on their head. Uh, not just in the last 40 years, but in the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, as late as 1960, almost 30% of college, of US women with a college degree remain single. But today, college-educated women are the most likely uh, to marry. Um, the same transformation has now occurred in most wealthy Western countries, and just within the last few years in Japan and Taiwan, uh, although not yet in China. It used to be that the most economically successful women were the least likely to marry. Today, the reverse is true. Uh, in the United States, in fact, high-earning women are the only group of women whose marriage rates have actually increased in the last uh, 20 years. In the past, a marriage in which a wife had more education than her husband was more likely to end in divorce uh, than a marriage in which uh, the husband had more education or the same. But in marriages in the US formed since uh, the 1990s, there is no added risk of divorce for couples in which the uh, wife has more education than the husband. And in fact, when a husband has more education than the wife, that couple actually has a higher risk of divorce, suggesting that older gender patterns uh, may now be a greater threat 
uh, to many marriages than new ones. And in Denmark, we've seen a really rapid transformation. Uh, the educational uh, ones trends are the same as in the U.S. Um, the, but we've always found that when a wife suddenly jumps past her husband in her earnings power, that raises the risk of divorce. That has now disappeared among high educated couples in, uh, in Denmark and has reduced so much among the less educated couples that it seems likely to disappear in the next few years. Now, and I, and I do want to tell you the background to the supposedly sexless equal marriages that uh, the New York Times trumpeted. Uh, Kemsgate came from, a, came from an academic sociological article based on longitudinal study gathered in 1991 and 92. Now, <laughs> you know, some of you are smiling because, of course, that includes many marriages formed in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s when such uh, egalitarian marriages were uncommon, deviant, often reflected some serious issues uh, between the couples. So when some uh, sociologists had the um, sense to say, well, let's restrict our um, our data to marriages formed since the early 1990s and use data from 2006 to 2010, they found that um, heterosexual couples who shared housework and childcare had reported the highest level of marital uh, and sexual satisfaction. And, and um, uh, many uh, women I know just love this particular weapon in their in the <laughs> chore wars uh, and the most frequent sex. <laughs> It is true that gender, uh, the progress of the gender revolution did destabilize many marriages. But in many ways, it now has the opposite effect. Uh, that stabilizing effect of gender equality is especially evident in Western European and Nordic countries, um, where employers and government policies make it easier for men and women to practice equality and breadwinning and at home. In the countries with the most generous work family pop supports, Wives who engage in paid work, who traditionally have had more chan higher chances of divorce, if only because they, they can <laughs> divorce, uh, than homemaker wives, now have lower rates of divorce than homemaker wives. Um, in both cohabiting and, um, and married unions in the US and Western Europe, men who do more child care, when men do more child care, that stabilizes those unions and increases the chances that they will transition to marriage. Uh, it also even seems to make women more uh, willing to have a second or third child uh, and contributing to an upturn in infertility in some European countries. And this is where I think the spread of same-sex marriage has such potential for heterosexual marriage because are not, are not stymied by those same kind of gender stereotypes. They not only share more equally, but they discuss more equally uh, how to share in ways that actually uh, reflect their individual interests and are not contaminated by the gender stereotypes. There are other fascinating differences that John Gottman has found uh, in terms of problem solving between heterosexual and same-sex couples, and we can talk about this in the, um, in the question period if we like. Uh, but it's true that even heterosexual men have joined the, um, the gender revolution. A study of 14 Western countries found that between 1965 and 2011, uh, on average, husbands doubled the amount of time they spend on housework, tripled the amount of time on childcare. In the 1970s, and this even applies to uh, less educated husbands in the 1970s, did much less housework than their more educated counterparts. But by the early 21st century, they were doing as much or more housework. In fact, in many um, the housework, in many educated couples, the housework had leveled off. College-educated men still devote um, more time, uh, more hours to childcare. And in here the gap has grown, not because lesser educated men are not increasing their contributions to childcare, but because uh, they, college educated men and women are increasing them even faster. And this raises a point we don't have time to get into now. There's a point at which the returns to that may not be good for either the kids or for the marriage, uh, but are in fact a response to this increasing inequality and the panic that educated couples feel about giving their kids a, a head start. But be that as, uh, as it may, it's time to absolutely re retire the claim that uh, women uh, who work do a second shift. 
Uh, it's simply not true. Recent surveys suggest that in most couples now share housework evenly before the birth of a child. It's only after the arrival of a child that wives begin to do substantially more housework uh, and, of course, child care uh, than their husbands. But this is largely accounted for by the fact that men tend to increase their paid work hours after the arrival of a child, while women <coughs> tend to decrease theirs. When we turn our attention away from the division of housework at home and childcare to the overall hours of paid and unpaid work together, um, it turns out, and again, a study of detailed time diaries from 14 Western countries, uh, that aside from the first several months of childbirth, women's share of all work and men's share of all work, paid and unpaid together, hovers around the 50% uh, mark. Uh, so this is, the, the problem is not that men are, are slackers. <laughs> the problem is that, uh, I, I mean, it's very hard to make a case that a man who takes on longer paid work hours is asserting, is asserting male privilege. You know, that's not his, that, he's not doing that because he wants to, to assert his privilege. However, of course, as you know, it does increase his long-term male privilege. It multiplies men's earnings advantages, leaving women very vulnerable in case of their husband's death or disability or in case of divorce. It also gives them, uh, in the long run, a somewhat less clout within marriage, although even that's uh, changing. But uh, it also makes men second class. Uh, it also decreases men's access to family life. So it also has um, problems for men. This. So as I mentioned earlier, while the gender pay gap has actually decreased just as gender, the parenthood pay gap uh, in a world that requires two earner families has increased immensely, and it is still women who take on most of the, the parenting. This is not necessarily by choice. There are very interesting, um, I don't have time to go into them all, but very interesting experiments uh, uh, where you set up people with choices of different, that you work in so that they don't know this is actually part of the scenario, different kinds of work family scenarios, and you ask what the division of labor would be. And uh, it's mu most men and women of all college uh, groups want it to be egalitarian. When there is not family um, policy, um, more women want it to be, um, to, excuse me, uh, more women and most men want to fall back on a neo-traditional division of labor. The only interesting exception, uh, and this may explain some of the, the things that we'll get to a little bit later, is that um, more uh, less educated women with lower earnings potential are uh, willing to say that they'd rather be the primary breadwinner or go it alone than do that. And we can talk about why that would make that seemingly irrational uh, decision. <clears throat> but um, it's the lack of family-friendly work policies are the real problem here. Public child care, for example, especially for children under three, has tremendously powerful effects in boosting women's employment and lowering the wage gaps. The, the per-child wage penalty in countries with minimal public um, uh, child care is 9.5%. Uh, that shrinks to 4% in countries with more expansive uh, public ch uh, child care. The gap in employment probabilities between mothers and childless women in countries with minimal public employment uh, with public child care is over 18%. It shrinks to only 2% in countries with the highest observed uh, child care uh, enrollment rates. Um, paid leave is also important, but I'm sure most of you know that, that there's, a, there's, a, there's a sweet spot <laughs> there. That, um, that when mothers are offered very, that mothers' wages uh, and employment suffers when they have two short leaves, but when they're offered the long three-year care leaves, two to three care leaves that are common in places like Germany, they also suffer and, because um, uh, employers start to discriminate. Uh, against women in those cases. Um, so all of these things are, it's, it's extremely important that we adjust our, the, the, the last frontier in a sense in equalizing uh, family life, in equalizing uh, the relationships between partners, cohabiting or, or uh, married, 
and in, in giving children the benefits of involved fathering, which are quite extensive. Uh, when we look at average the benefits of fathering on kids, we don't find any extent, but that's because so many fathers are not involved fathering. When we actually get to involved ones, we see tremendously important impacts. All of that means that we really have to uh, find out uh, how to have the same affirmative action programs that we had to bring women into the workforce to bring men back into family life. Um, and when governments do uh, reserve uh, 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 paid leave uh, at, a, at, a, at a good high enough uh, subsidization rate that, that it makes sense for family and, ex and reserve it exclusively for fathers so that it's a use it or lose it thing. They can't just turn it over and you know, go by inertia. We find that this is, is a tremendously important uh, reform and will probably have huge long-term effects. When such uh, quotas were introduced in Quebec and Norway, the number of men taking leave soared into the 70, 80, um, and reaching 90% in, in some areas. And when men spend even a short time doing such hands-on parents, we have studies on that, uh, not only from Quebec and, Quebec and uh, Norway, but also in uh, the OECD made a study of US, um, Australia, Britain, and Denmark. Men who take parental leave develop habits that persist long after they go to work. Their wives are more, li are, are more likely to, take paid, uh, to stay in paid employment. They are more likely to remain engaged fathers, to read to their children, uh, to remain engaged uh, long after they've gone back to work. So in sum, what I'm saying here is the gender revolution is real, it is ongoing, it has raised our expectations of people's behavior toward their partners, their children, um, and to the extent that individuals have the economic security, social support systems, uh, personal stability, and cultural resources to meet the challenges associated with those higher and more complex expectations that we have developed, it has had positive effects on family life. It has actually stabilized and enriched many heterosexual marriages. It has allowed new forms of families to emerge and under the right conditions to flourish. Uh, we're finding um, when you control for economics that cohabiting um, families do just as well in raising kids. Single parent families, very interesting uh, new studies that show that um, the average deficits of single parent families are only those for less educated mothers who are less likely to have the resources and the social support systems. They do not apply um, to the highly educated single uh, mothers. Uh, same sex families. So it's, and it's created also growing numbers of successful divorces. Uh, more cooperative parenting, more amicable, um, uh, more mediation, um, so that we can see um, you know, some real interesting changes there. More involvement of men who no longer consider parental involvement a package deal, but want to stay involved with their kids after divorce. Uh, it's also made it far more possible for individuals uh, to live single lives very successfully and fulfilling. Educated, never married women, for example, actually live longer than the average uh, woman. And women who have been employed through their lives are much healthier uh, than women uh, who do not have uh, full-time employment. The health gap, men are catching up too. There used to be this huge health gap between married men and single men because you know the men expected the women to make sure they, they got their doctor's appointment and ate their broccoli and all those <laughs> sorts of things. Uh, that health gap has almost disappeared. Um, murder rates used to be, uh, a, 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 in a cohabiting relationship, uh, the murder rate of, of cohabiting women used to be eight to nine times higher than that of married uh, women in both Canada and the United States. It has now disappeared, the difference in the United States, and reduced substantially in Canada, uh, and may have disappeared, uh, but the last, uh, the, the newest results are not out. But that economic inequality revolution is also real and it has had largely negative effects on interpersonal stability and family relations. The U.S. is the most extreme case, that's the, the, the data I'm most familiar with, so I'll use a little bit of that. But everywhere, the educational and economic gap 
uh, between rich and poor has been rising. It's been rising much more, especially the educational gap uh, between rich and poor in the United States. Everywhere we are seeing the increasing marginalization of low income, less educated men in particular, uh, as traditional job ladder ladders in industrial craft and manual and semi-skilled occupations have been disappearing and real wages have been falling. In fact, in fully 96 uh, of, of 135 countries where gender and or wage gaps have narrowed since 1991, this convergence is partly accounted for by declines in men's employment and wage rates rather than increases uh, in women's. And it's against this backdrop of limited economic gains for poorly educated women, starting from the lower base, uh, but real economic gains, giving them some options, um, falling wages and job opportunities for poorly educated men, that we must place the most dramatic and most misunderstood aspect of widening economic inequality and insecurity and the, this new class-based divergence in marriage rates and relationship stability. Um, again, uh, I have to work uh, mostly with US data here, but I want to give you an example just of how extreme it is. In the 1940s and 1950s, marriage rates all over differed very little uh, by class uh, and education. In fact, high school educated uh, men and women were more likely to marry than more educated or less educated. Um, this was a traditional backbone of the post-war working class. The two pillars of that family economy, though, uh, in the U.S. and elsewhere, were an economy um, of, of that stable working class family, were an economy in which young men could practically guarantee to get living wage, blue collar jobs right after leaving high school or the military, depending on where they went, or in a culture where women had very little chance to strike out on their own and to support themselves. In the United States, for example, the real median income for young men aged 25 to 29 tripled in the years <clears throat> between the end of World War II and 1974. From a very early age, a young man could expect to support a family solely on his own earnings with the realistic expectation of out-earning his father and his grandfather and seeing steadily growing wages over time. That's a real socialization experience. It tends to create maturity uh, because, when you, because you have, when you have that kind of hope and that kind of, uh, okay, deferred gratification, oh, it actually works, <laughs> you know? Um, so that expectations encouraged men to assume the responsibilities and of course the considerable privileges uh, of married life in those days. Women, of course, had much more limited job and earnings prospects uh, which is why, uh, in fact, the gap uh, widened throughout that period, which is why, of course, so many of them were willing, after knowing someone for only six months, <laughs> to get married, um, quit school or a dead-end job, and follow the near-unanimous advice of experts to exempt their husband from household chores, to adjust their interests uh, to his, uh, and to make nearly all the compromises required in that relationship and to stay in it no matter, almost no matter what the cost. Now, of course the hold of these marriage norms weakened for a lot of reasons. The youth rebellion, the, uh, the, the, the women's movement, um, <coughs> people delayed married, premarital sex and cohabitation lost their stigma, divorce rates rose. But the most dramatic and difficult changes in family life in the U.S. and elsewhere, uh, and the stability uh, and in family instability, have occurred when the expansion of individual rights and new opportunities in civil rights ran up against the contraction of the shared economic life that had marked the post-war era. Uh, in the U.S., the median real wages of 25 to 29-year-old male workers declined by almost 30 percent between 1974 and 2013. And that actually understates the decline in young men's earnings because it only counts full-time workers. Uh, there was, since the early 1980s, there's been a major drop in full-time labor force participation uh, among young men. Overall today, among uh, single adults aged 25 to 34, there are only 84 currently employed single men for every 100 single women. And in our black communities, only 51 currently employed single black men 
for every 100 single black women. Marriage has become a better deal if you can get it and make it work, but a riskier deal uh, if there's any chance that you're not going to. A low-earning partner would be better than nothing, but as you can see from that statistic, nothing is a real possibility, and a woman in particular has to uh, really hesitate before she hitches herself to a man who might lose his job or misuse her resources uh, and thus become a burden rather than a co-provider, uh, she might be worse, uh, do much better to invest in her own earnings power and stay single. Uh, and of course, men are less willing to marry a woman with no earnings power than in the past for their part. Um, as the economic security gap between one earner and two earner families has grown. So marriage has these big payoffs when it works, but it's also riskier than the past in comparison to investing in your own individual future. This is what the cultural conservatives call the rise of individualism. Um, and at the same time, the very things that have improved marriage and other close relationships, uh, I, I want to leave time for um, for questions, but since we started 15 minutes late, uh, okay. <laughs> the um, very things that have improved marriage and other close relationships for many modern couples. Making families, when they work, fairer, more satisfying, rewarding for family members than any people of the past. You know, I've studied marriages over the last 5,000 years. I mean, not my 5,000 years. <laughs> Uh, would ever have dared to dream. Also make marriage less desirable if it even looks like it might fail. And it also <coughs> makes it less bearable when it doesn't deliver its promised benefits. And at the same time, it makes it harder to get those promised benefits, our higher, better expectations of marriage, the decline of male privilege and female deference that have improved so many relationships have all multiplied the work that it takes to keep a relationship from failing. You know, that, that you know, when marriage was a stronger institution uh, in the past, it was not, <laughs> you always get this, one of my students once wrote a, an essay in which she said, couples nowadays don't respect the marriage vowels. <laughs> Which I just thought was absolutely delightful, you know, like I owe you. But you get the sense that somehow couples are not willing to work on their relationships the way they did in the past. They didn't have to work on their relationships in the past. What was there to work at? The rules were absolutely clear, the alternatives were almost nil. Um, so the very same things that have improved the potential uh, of marriage has made it more fulfilling and more intimate and fairer than ever before, have also increased the points at which it can fail. Um, marriage as a relationship between two individuals is taken more seriously and comes with higher emotional expectations than at any point in history. But marriage as an institution, because of our civil rights uh, that we've gained, exerts less power over people's lives than it once did. Um, I love the analogy that historian Nancy Cott makes. She says that one way to understand the changes in marriage is to see them as analogous to the changes when they disestablished the, uh, the official churches. Um, when, one state stopped, when the state stopped supporting one official church, religion didn't disappear, but obviously new sectors, sects and churches uh, proliferated. And even when people stayed in the old church, or joined it for the first time, they did so for very different reasons than when it was the only game in town. Even the traditional church had to change the way it recruited members and held their loyalty. And prospective church members, here's where I like the analogy for relationships, had to examine their own values and behaviors and goals as they never had before. And that is one of the real dilemmas that we're getting. Um, this is a, a it, the, the result is that uh, it, is, it creates really tough dilemmas for people who live in communities without the economic or educational resources, stable environments, social support systems, and just daily predictability of life that foster the patience to negotiate 
the skills to uh, negotiate, the resilience to repair breaches in a relationship, the rewards for walking away from conflicts or tamping it down, the incentives to refrain from behaviors that offer short-term comforts or escape but undermine long-term ties. Um, neither economic nor cultural factors. You know, that we, we're always, uh, you know, I go to sociological conventions and I'm actually a historian, but I think I'm an honorary, I think sociologists like me better than historians and sometimes <laughs> I feel the same way. Um, <laughs> But, but there's this big debate, what is it, culture or values? You cannot disentangle them. And we have to be more sophisticated. And in my, my last uh, few minutes of my talk, I want to talk about uh, why I think we have to be more sophisticated and more honest about how these two things uh, interact. Um, what we're dealing with is this very confusing mix of new, though fragile, economic options for women very demoralizing economic losses for many men, the persistence of older expectations of male breadwinning, and you can understand why those persist in low-income communities uh, even more than in the communities that have the luxury of saying, well, I don't mind if my husband makes less than me because, you know, that's great. He'll just do maybe a little more housework. Um, Alongside the erosion of the masculine entitlements that were traditionally attached to male breadwinning and family obligation, you've got people's rising expectations for equality and fairness in personal relationships combined with their fading hopes for equality and fairness in economic life, and blocked opportunities for individual achievement in the new areas of life that offer new sources of self-esteem and new sources of gender identity other than male breadwinning or motherhood. Um, all of these makes relationships especially difficult to individuals who don't have the new educational advantages, economic opportunities, uh, and social community support systems. Um, and who live, for example, in the kind of impoverished communities where they have a long history of injurious uh, at the, at, or at least disappointing, interactions of long-term stability. So, I want to end by saying what I think some of our made most pressing tasks are as researchers and practitioners in light of these. First, of course, is to recognize how these class and gender dynamics are changing the rules and outcomes of many long-established psychological and sociological observations. We've already talked about it, some of the changing predictors of marriage, marital satisfaction, and divorce. When we average out cohabitation, stunning changes there. Um, for most of the 20th century, couples who cohabited before marriage had a greater chance of divorce than those who moved directly into marriage. But on average, in most countries that have adopted new modern values, cohabitation before marriage is no longer associated with an elevated risk of marital dissolution. Here in Australia, you've actually seen a reversal. A study of marriages formed between 1965 uh, and 1945 and 2000 found that the early marriages, premarital cohabitation, cohabitation predicted divorce. It converged, converged till it's about equal, and now actually premarital cohabitation on average predicts greater success in marriages. I think we'll probably see that elsewhere. Uh, in the U.S., we've just seen, a, 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 we've just put out um, a remarkable new study that showed, it just in a stunningly short period of time, uh, in the United States, couples who lived together and had a kid together and then married after the child's birth, they did get married, uh, between 1985 and 1995, those couples were 60% more likely to divorce than couples who married before having a child. A decade later, for cohabiting couples who had a child together between 1997 and 2010, those who married after the child's birth were no more likely to divorce than those who married um, before starting a family, or those who married and then had a child without ever living together. Stunning turnaround. However, where we don't see a turnaround is that the couples who lived together, had a baby, and didn't marry at all remained much more likely to break up. 
and there's much more, many more of those couples who are living together, having a child, and then breaking up. So the things that have stabilized family life for children of educated couples who are staying together longer during their prime child rearing years are creating more instability uh, for the children uh, who are born into these um, uh, unstable relationships. And you know, <clears throat> we, I think that sometimes, and, and, and I do it, I know myself, because in the United States we have a particularly strong idea that if, you, if people would just, you know, have good values and care about marriage and relationships, um, then this would solve all their problems. Uh, and as a result and a reaction, I think sometimes uh, we bend the stick the other direction and we don't talk about some of the real problems that these couples do face. Um, one problem is that, uh, again, is simply uh, practical. Um, Low-income and less educated couples proceed, enter into cohabitation much more swiftly than that of more educated counterparts. Half of our college-educated women who cohabit are romantically involved for more than a year before making that move. More than two-thirds wait for more than two years. But for couples with a high school education or less, the average time it takes to move in is six months. Same amount of time that you, you got, took to get married in the 1960s. And for the poorest one, uh, it's, it's uh, even faster. Um, you've got, a, a, Linda Burton does wonderfully interesting research about how the daily grind of poverty combined with new gender expectations fuels this longing for romance. But that in turn works in tandem with practical considerations such as sharing expenses uh, or escaping from a bad living situation uh, to encourage the rapid acceleration of relationships. And inevitably, some of these relationships are not a good match. Some of these partners are not a good bet. Uh, yet moving in together sets a dynamic in motion that makes volatile relationships and pregnancies more likely. Um, so this used to work, by the way. This is not a new idea. That's how most women got, you know, almost uh, more than a quarter of American women did that to get married in the 60s, and it worked. You know, they got pregnant, and the guy said, okay, I'll marry you. Doesn't work nowadays. Uh, or just out of seeing motherhood as the most achievable route to finding self-esteem and a sense of meaning in their lives than anything else they can imagine. Um, but most births to cohabiting, uh, to low-income women, are not act actively and consciously planned. Uh, they're also not actively and consciously avoided. And this is the dilemma that we need to explain more clearly to the public and politicians. People tend to fall into living together, and they tend to fall into parenting in ways that are riskier than the past, in, in light of the loss of economic options and social supports for early marriage uh, and early child rearing. And I think we have a huge challenge in how we explain uh, 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 what Paula England, uh, sociologist Paula England, um, uh, had calls this lack of efficacy in people's lives. Uh, conservatives believe it's all the personal characteristics, right? Liberals too easily jump to the structural and social uh, origins without admitting the dysfunctions that, that, um, that do occur as a result, or implying that if we just gave them money, they would just go away. Um, so I don't think we've been effective enough in explaining how these personal and interpersonal uh, deficits do exist, but that they do not uh, uh, reflect inborn character flaws. Uh, they don't reflect lack of good values or good intentions. They're certainly not going to be solved by preaching or lecturing at people. We need to show, we need research that shows more concretely, more humanely, um, and more plausibly than a lot of the research does, how chronic economic insecurity, erratic work conditions uh, and opportunities, unpredictable support networks, uh, chaotic living conditions, uh, undermine people's confidence in being able to control their own future sap the energy required to resist in activities whose rewards uh, seem far off. 
Um, people who live in these conditions are so overwhelmed with the constraints of daily survival that they often just don't have the intellectual and emotional bandwidth to deal with long-term planning. And one of the most interesting new sets of studies that is coming out shows that practice does not make perfect when it comes to deferring gratification. The more often you have to do it, the less energy you have for doing it just one more time. Uh, this is something that's a very important, I think, for us to be able to show. Deferring gratification or having it kicked out from under you is not a good learning <laughs> experience. It goes the opposite direction. Um, of course, when it comes to avoiding pregnancy, economists have, have had a long-standing phrase, uh, low opportunity costs, that help us see why low-income individuals have less incentive uh, to, to, to do the kind of hard work that it takes, because low-income pe uh, people, uh, women, for women in areas of high unemployment and inadequate schools, postponing childbirth has fewer payoffs and having children imposes early, fewer uh, additional disadvantages than it does for women who live, who live in communities with better opportunities. But that's not the whole story. Too often, and I plead guilty to having helped some of my students who've written articles on this, end it right there as though it were somehow just rational uh, to go ahead and have the baby. It's not. This lack of efficacy and personal follow, uh, follow through in personal life can produce family situations that perpetuate or worsen the economic and social deprivation of young parents and their children. Somehow we have to admit that without falling into the opposite mistake uh, of thinking that, that situations and decisions or lack of decisions that may exacerbate chaos and poverty and poor outcomes are the ultimate cause of those uh, poor outcomes. Um, as you all know, many of the apparent effects of, of family structure disappear or are greatly reduced when we control for factors such as parental substance abuse, depression, unemployment, personality disorders, exposure to aggressive, um, violent uh, behavior, um, all of which have negative outcomes. And uh, so it's very important for us to continue to point out, there's a, a study just this year by Michael Rosenfeld Finds, finds that a lot, that almost all of the, the negative child outcomes associated with single parent families become statistically insignificant once you take the amount of family instability and number of family transitions into account. Um, but I think that when we're dealing with families that are, who's, where long-term impoverishment is entangled with racial and ethnic uh, discrimination, as you are here in Australia, as we are here in the United States, we also have to be very modest what we can tr control for. I would like to best to be very skeptical about how much you can control for in these kind of studies. Let, I, I found, if you'll just bear with me a couple of minutes, I wanted to tell you a, a, some studies that have just changed the way I think about these kinds of things. Um, in the US, for example, researchers commonly find that African-American uh, men and women have lower marriage rates, higher relationship problems, higher divorce rates uh, than whites, even when you control for social and economic and educational status. Uh, and it may be that there are some important value uh, differences, including a longer tradition of female independence and a higher orientation toward extended family ties uh, than, than marital ones. But I have come to believe that most of the characteristics of black family life that are usually attributed to distinctive racial traditions are actually a result of distinctive racist traditions that have, re that have created an accumulation of economic, social, environmental, and personal stressors that simply have no counterparts in other parts of society for which you can control. For example, uh, almost a third of black Americans born between 1985 and 2000 live in neighborhoods where 30% or more of the residents are poor. Those are also neighborhoods that have more violence, that have more pollutants. That, I mean, you can just, you, you can, I don't have to, to, to tell sociologists what else 
only 1% of whites born during that period lived in similar concentrations of poverty. There is no way to control for the differences between black and whites there. How do you control for the fact, you, if you take a black student with a high school education and a white student with a high school education, that two thirds of black students with a high school education grow up in impoverished schools where the vast majority of uh, their students are also impoverished. No way to control, the high school education is not a good control factor. Robert, um, it was stunning to my ears. Um, uh, fertility um, kind of uh, interventions that we should have long-acting fertility implants that this was the answer when to me it seems that well isn't isn't shouldn't the finger wagging be at people running the economy you know the lack of regulation the lack of generation of jobs but no it was about well if we could just get implants into people <laughs> that would solve the a kind of family problems so I'd love your um, reflection well, um, I do think that um, providing more accessible uh, contraception and talking to young girls about the dangers of uh, not using contraception consistently uh, and convincing those of them who really don't want to have kids to have long-term implants, I think that's a, a, an absolutely fine part of the program, but it can't be all of the program. Um, because first of all, it will not convince the people who are frightened with some reason that uh, that's the same as sterilization. Um, it's not, you know, it's actually, it's actually a very good new invention uh, and we should uh, take advantage of it where we can. But it's not going to prevent some people from being legitimately frightened after a long years of experience of what the intentions are. It's not going to convince some people to, um, to to give up on an, the, the chance that maybe they would like to have a kid earlier. Um, so it has to be in combination with other kinds of economic and, and social changes. Um, so, so I'm not opposed to it, but it's not a solution. And that's what we're getting right. We've, we've seen an interesting, um, interesting change in the dialogue in the United States. It may be slipping backwards now, from having listened to a few of the um, summaries of the Republican debates. Um, but um, we went through this period uh, where both Democrats and Republicans were all on this idea that if we could promote marriage and just tell people uh, you know, to wait for marriage, you know, that would work. Well, first of all, the pr marriage promotion didn't work, and secondly, um, poverty rates have been going up among married couple families too. So now the big deal um, is you've had a kind of move from some of the more extreme conservatives on this part to what they call a middle ground and that is to promote the six sex, it's called, Isabel uh, Saddle calls it the six sex sequence. Um, that you uh, complete schooling, uh, you uh, get a job, whatever job, however much your, your schooling um, provides, you go to college if possible, and you postpone babies until you're married, and that will solve your problem. Um, and for her, for her, she has decided, she, she, she has admits, and many of her colleagues who used to be in marriage promotion admit that marriage promotion doesn't work. But if we could at least get uh, women to postpone having babies until they were in their 30s, um, that that would help. Well, it probably would help, but it's not going to work unless we are also providing the kind of opportunities that make people think that it's worthwhile postponing it. You also have to deal with the fact that in terms of health and well-being, um, Early childbearing is not a, as much of a health hazard. And in fact, for black women, delaying is a health ha hazard. Philip Cohen just recently found out that, um, the, that although there's a classic U-shaped pattern for white women where your risk of, um, your risk of uh, infant mortality is high for very young, goes way down 
uh, and then it goes uh, slightly up um, as, as you get much older, that this doesn't work uh, for black women, that um, their infant mortality rates actually grow higher as they grow older, almost fairly steadily. Uh, and I don't think many of them are reading these sociological studies and saying, therefore, I'll have a baby. But you know, I had a, a student um, just sum it up, I thought, very, very well. I, last spring, I uh, had a much more diverse uh, economically group of students than I'd ever had before. So when we got to discussing this, I had five students in, in a class of 24 who were willing to talk about one of them whose father was a prostitute uh, and a crack addict and had just been, you know, another, you know, you know stories that the, the rest of the students <laughs> here was practically standing on an edge. What was interesting about all five of these students, um, three of them already had kids. Um, one young boy who I think is just, it's just going to go so far, says, I'm so lucky because I had a kid, I my Despite how poor I was, um, we I grew up next to this girl, and we you know I think that we're going to make it. Uh, but when we got pregnant, we, we did get married and you know have a baby. Uh, two of them were single moms. One said, "I will never have a baby um, because all my sisters did, and I'm not going to do that." Um, but she said, "It's ruined my family life. I have nothing in common with." my friends, with my family, my mother, you know. And then one that I had no idea, she had not talked about her poverty background, and she was so articulate and so, um, such a good writer that I really assumed she was from a middle class background. Um, she was pregnant, um, but I, you know. She, and she, suddenly she raised her hand and she said, well, you may have noticed that I'm very pregnant. She said, I'm not married. I think I can get into graduate school. This was an accident. But the background, and then she explained her background, she said, you get, a, a, it was an unexpected gift, but if you turn down a gift in my history, it never comes back again. So I can't turn down a gift. I wouldn't want to give. So as long as people have that kind of mentality, those kind of accumulated experiences of disappointment, you know, the success sequence has to be built upon real changes in the economy. So I agree with you, but I, I wouldn't go so far as to say that it's not part of an option, is, is giving people that option. Because there are lots of kids who, who really would like to postpone their, their children, but it's just so hard, especially a young girl who is under pressure from a guy you know, to you know, have sex right now. Um, if she's got something that she doesn't have to get up and resist, you know, and have him mad, mad at her for doing so, that's that's an advantage. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Okay. yeah. All right. Thanks, Stephanie. That was a wonderful presentation. I really enjoyed it.